Good evening. Uh, welcome to another Royal Mile Whiskies Tasting. Tonight, Glen Allerkey with Billy Walker and a guest. So, uh, Glen Allerkey Distillery, until Billy, uh, until Billy bought it in 2017, hitherto fairly unknown. Uh, let's start, actually, just by showing a little aerial shot of Glen Allerkey in the sun. So, just a few seconds of a drone shot. So, a modern distillery built in 1967, purpose-built, um, and for much of its life, most of it going into blended whiskey. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, some very fine drams. So let's just actually start with a little bit of housekeeping, basic housekeeping. So dramming order, we'll start with the 12 year old, then we'll have the 15 year old. And then of course, the two single cask samples. Um, you can see some strengths there, minimum 46% and up to 60.5%. So if you haven't already, I suggest uh, getting a little jug of water to put on the side. Um, because one of them in particular is quite pokey. And how's this going to work then? What's the plan? So Glenallachy kindly have uh, bottled up all these miniatures. You have them in your hands, hopefully now. Uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you, David. And thank you also, Greg, for uh, sealing them. Um, that was all hand done and a great lot of effort went into it. So thank you very much. And the casts are ready and raring to go. So all drinkers will get one vote. Um, you should already have received a link into your email uh, this afternoon. If not, check your spam folder. You can do it after the tasting or tomorrow morning because at lunchtime tomorrow, we will uh, check which cask has proven to be the most popular and we will issue instructions to Glen Allerkey to have it bottled up um, and put on the market as a Royal Mile Whiskies exclusive, probably mid-November, depending on bottling schedules. Although I had a quick chat with Billy and bottling schedules are uh, rather condensed at the moment. So we'll see how we get on. But the first thing is, is the fun part of uh, picking a cask. So that's um, basically what we're going to do. Uh, it's a people's choice kind of vibe tonight. So as our special guest to come in later on, we've actually got a punter, a whiskey fan, um, uh, Sean Russell. I'll introduce him later. Some of you may already be uh, aware of who he is but we thought it'd be a nice thing given that um this is a people's choice to you know let a, a, a fan a whiskey drinker ask billy a few questions so we'll bring him in around the uh, cask sampling stage but before i bring billy in i think it's um oh actually in, in terms of questions as well hopefully if we get through everything there'll be a time for a little bit of a q a towards the end so if you save up your questions towards the end then we'll bring a few of our favourites onto the screen for Billy to answer, depending on timing. Hopefully, we can get through everything. An hour, a little, a little over an hour. That's what we're trying to uh, trying to do here. So, but before I bring Billy in, I think it's worth giving a little bit of context. I don't like to assume that everyone knows uh, who Billy Walker is. Um, many of you will, but I think it's worth just giving a little bit of a context to, to Glen Allerkey and also the the Ben Reek story that came before. So. Billy has uh, a long career in the whiskey industry, trained as a chemist, using those uh, technical skills in distilling, blending, bottling, all the areas of production. But beyond that as well, I would say there's an extra level of interest as he is known and reputed as a businessman as well, something of a deal maker, as uh, the Ben Reich, Glen Dronach, Glen Grasser story was an amazing one. So uh, Billy and his team bought Ben Reich in 2004 for about £5 million, I think it was. Um, and then Glen Dronach in 2008 and then Glen Glasser in 2013. So these are three distilleries that were known to people like me and whiskey fans and, and, you know, and hardcore whiskey enthusiasts. But they primarily existed to provide malt whiskey for blends. Uh, Glen Dronach was something of a sleeping giant. It had been quite popular, but none of these three distilleries have been actively or consistently marketed. And over the next period, up until 2016, when the business was sold, it was an incredible success story. And, and, and um, I mean, to use rather slightly cold commercial terms, brands were built, value was added, and money was made. And but behind that, also, there was a great deal of love and affection for what 
these guys had did because we're all whiskey fans and our customers are whiskey fans and there's you know if you're a fan of a of a band you can't really be a fan of a band unless you get to listen to the songs and they released a lot and they released it a lot very very well lots of affordable very high quality um natural color cast strength or higher strength age stated whiskey and i suppose all great deals are dependent on timing and uh and billy and his team's timing was perfect just when other distilleries were having to pull age statements off the bottle they were able to release really high quality and really glendronic is what we're all talking about just when another famous space hides distillery famous for maturing in cherry carts was having to pull age statements off bottles here was glendronic 12 glendronic 15 glendronic 18 glendronic 21 and and sold at great prices so uh money was made and you know fair play to him i think it was 280 odd million an offer too good to refuse i think that wasn't part of billy and his team's plans to sell it at that point but when you get an offer like that it is um very hard to refuse and not long after um he bought glenarachy which was even more hidden was even more unknown and I'm sure we'll talk about this. It was a blank slate to many whiskey fans. I've been a whiskey buyer for 20 odd years. I've maybe tried three bottlings or something like that with Glen Alecky. So, so many people went along that journey with uh, with Benry, Glendronach and Glasser. And we can't wait to see what he does with Glen Alecky. And of, of course, already bottlings are already coming out. Um, but we know that's only the start and there is so much goodwill for what's not only a great business success story, but, um, uh, but also uh, whiskey, you know, given to the people. It felt like it was a gift to us because um, we could all afford it. We could all enjoy it. So anyway, I'll, um, I'll bring uh, Billy up on the screen now. Um, hi, Billy. How are you doing? Hi, guys. How are you? Yes, very good. Um, Welcome. Thank you uh, very much for joining us. So we're going to start with Glen Alecky 12. And as with most of our tastings, I don't think we need to spend too much time telling people how it, how it kind of tastes. Um, I would love to talk about um, the process of buying a distillery. This is the Glen Alecky 12 um, with a combination of maturation and PX, Oloroso and Virgin Oak casks. Um, and uh, yeah, so Billy, please. Tell me, what, what is the process of buying a distillery? Um, how do you go about that? What a question, uh, Arthur, but I think it's a, from my point of view, the, the, the start of the journey is to decide um, what is it, what is it you want to buy? Um, and our kind of uh, the kind of audience that we want to engage with, I mean, right at the start and for many, many years after I had left uh, Burn Stewart, the one promise I had made to myself was that uh, we would not deal with uh, travel retail or multiple retailers, that our kind of, our kind of uh, basket was the kind of routes to market would be with private, um, independent, uh, imported distributors, retailers. So when the decision to, when you make the decision to buy a distillery uh, in the belief that you can actually can do it, because it really isn't all that easy. Our formula would have been, we need to buy something that is relatively unknown, that it is a blank sheet of paper, um, and that it hasn't been exposed to the market, it hasn't been compromised by going into the, the kind of uh, roots of the market that, A, we don't want to be in and, and be more, be uncomfortable to be in. Um, and there was a number that, that, that uh, kind of uh, ticked the right boxes. Um, but ticking the right boxes and getting persuading somebody that they are comfortable to sell that particular story is much more difficult. Um, but we had a conversation. You might remember that the previous MD at Shivers was a gentleman and a real gentleman called uh, Laurel Lacassania. And we had we had had a really good working relationship with uh, Shivers and indeed with Diageo um, over a number of years uh, in the with the previous business. 
So I think they saw that we were safe hands and that there was a dialogue that could be started. Whether, in fact, there was a completion that could be achieved was another matter, and all the kind of commercial things then come into play. Um, but Glen Alkey ticked all the boxes. And from a, from a, a distillery point of view and a, and a whiskey and liquid point of view, I was familiar with uh, Glen Alkey for a number of years. I knew it wasn't a retiring or a shy space aid. Um, it was very pleasing to know that the band had not been exposed to the market. And so that was the start of the discussion. And then, of course, you get involved in uh, the most important thing is getting inventory that allows you to engage with the market and then follow your dreams in terms of an aging profile older and, uh, and plenty of follow through in terms of the plan. Um, so the, the discussion happened and it was a good discussion. Uh, uh, Warong was uh, very sympathetic to the idea. He took it to the board and, uh, and then the real hard talk started, you know, what's the price? What do we get for the price? And uh, eventually I think we managed to, we finally signed off, I think, in the third of October in 2017. All we were getting, we were getting a lot of inventory, which is really important going all the way back to, uh, to 1978. Um, and then we had to start looking at what do, what, what do we have here? What is the inventory like? Uh, what do we want to bring to the market? How do we want to define the personality of the distillery and the, and the DNA of the products that we want to bring to the market? And so the last few years has been really, it's not been hard work. It's been very interesting work, but challenging and very, very time consuming. Mm. Can I ask, because it, it's, it's an unusual thing to purchase a distillery because you're not only built buying a manufacturing unit, if again, I can use quite a cold term for that, but you know, um, a, a distillery, the, the bricks and mortar, the equipment, but you're also buying all that stock and you're also buying a brand. And I suppose with Glen Allerchy, a lot of that value was the stock rather than the brand because it was... There was no brand, effectively. And yeah, did and you have an opportunity to look more closely at the stock beyond what was on paper? Do you, you were familiar with it with from blending, but did, do you have the opportunity to have a little wander around the warehouse? Well, we had a wander around the warehouse, Arthur, but much more importantly, we got a fairly in-depth uh, look at uh, the, the, the the stock, the age of the stock, the the, the, AOR, the the maturation profile, but more importantly, what wood it was being matured in, and that kind of set our minds. That we then knew exactly the nature of the problem. If we wanted to go down the path as we have in making Cushing uh, Glenalchy in the direction of being recognised as a sherry style release then we had quite a lot of work to do. It's not that we didn't inherit uh, a significant number of sherry casks, but we looked at the makeup, which was a fairly traditional um, wood makeup uh, for, for most of the story, frankly. Um, uh, and as long as we saw that the, 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 the kind of management of the wood um, was, it was uh, signif significantly good, and in, in many ways we insisted that we got particular styles of where allocate particular cast styles, uh, that would allow us to take it on the next step of the journey. Um, it, it, that was quite important. We didn't spend an awful lot of time looking at the liquid. We, I mean, I was quite familiar with it. I said, it's not a, it's not a retiring uh, space side. We knew it was the style of spirit that could comfortably handle quite highly flavoured wood. And uh, that was already kind of imprinted in our minds. That's the direction we want to go in. And, Look, it's also fun. A lot of obstacles we got to climb over, but in the process, you're having fun and enjoying yourself, and uh, that's a great part of our industry. While we are um, all very competitive, but it, you know it's friendly competition, and um, you know people help each other. Mm. And I suppose your standing in the industry gave you yeah. that. Um, you know, they trusted you with something because there must have been, if you sold it, I'm sure there's plenty of people trotting around trying to buy a distillery in the last 10 years, but they don't actually change hands that often. And I think they knew you would do a good job. Yeah. Listen, Arthur, I think 
I don't think they, they, they were all that um, persuaded by the fact that we would do a good job, and I hope we are doing a good job, but they're, they're, they're absolutely persuaded that it has to go into safe hands. They don't mm. want any reputational damage. And, um, you know, that's the kind of covenant you have with companies like uh, the big boys, Chevis and Diageo, that, that, you know, if you're going to engage with them, you, you have to give a commitment that you're going to uh, behave responsibly and look after the, the whole experience, including the people and the side and whatever, responsibly, and indeed the category, ensure the integrity of the category. Mm -hmm. And then I suppose if we talk, you have the distillery, you've invested in wood, I'm sure your, your old contacts in car supply must have been delighted when they heard you taking <laughs> Glen Allachy. And then you go about looking at what you've got and designing a range. And I suppose it's a good time to talk about the Glen Allachy 12 year old and, and seeing how you're going to shape that spirit into your product range. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly how we went about it. I mean, we, there's nothing too, uh, too uh, kind of uh, over-creative about it. We, we knew we wanted to have a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old that kind of fitted the mold. Um, we then looked at the older infantry. 18-year-old um, was interesting. 25-year-old, we had plenty of 30-year-old, uh, quite a big slug of 30-year-old coming on tap next year. We wanted to be in a position where we could engage in various sectors of the market. Um, and we worked, we didn't think about bottling anything for about the first 12, I think, uh, 15 months. There was a lot of preparation, a lot of sample analysis in the lab constantly, looking at two, three hundred, four hundred samples uh, a week, um, getting the Bible prepared, understanding what we had that we could use immediately and what we had to do to ensure that there was a kind of continuum of the quality we're looking for going through. And during this whole process, and we're still in that process, frankly, where we are constantly moving the quality forward. I, mean, I said this, I think I said this to a colleague or certainly uh, um, somebody in the industry, we probably got to about 90% of where we were to still get another 10%. Um, and yes, we've done a huge amount of, uh, of management and continue to do um, I'm a big fan of understanding how how the whiskey interacts with various casks. Um, I was up at this little yesterday and looking at some 20 port casks. And the extraordinary thing in, in all of this is that there are always surprises and there will continue to be surprises. But, so we, we decided, yeah, 12 year old, uh, we wanted to have the DNA of this, uh, of this story going forward is going to be sherry style of whiskey um so you know we knew the building blocks where we had we had casts that had been in sherry from birth but a lot of casts that had been in, in, in um, american oak and uh, we also knew that we wanted to have maybe a little bit jag of uh, more honey kind of toffee notes and the kind of combination of the cast going into the 12 as you tasted is something like uh, 60 65 percent px 25% uh, or so 2025, the balance is uh, Appalachian Virgin Oak. Um, and on that basis, you know, there's a base there of the, the taste that we would expect this kind of formulation to deliver are honey, vanilla, butterscotch, toffee. Um, PX and the other also are going to bring in the spices, the gingers, the raisins, mocha, um, dark chocolate, orange peel. So that that's a kind of that's a kind of rainbow of flavours that you might expect in here, and and indeed I think they are all in here. And one of the great difficulties in this kind of experience in tasting is actually defining the taste. And somebody might say this is almonds, and somebody else might say, oh no no, it's marzipan. But essentially they're saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And as far I was thinking about it's just today how certain whiskies have been associated with a very precise uh, tasting descriptor. Um, Talasca, Spice, um, Lagavulin, Lapsang, Souchong, Old Pontney, Salt. And that maybe just comes from one writer, one of the early writers like Michael Jackson or Jim Murray. And then that very indelibly becomes associated with the whiskey. And it's like think, Yeah, very much so. Yeah, very much so. So the, the, the early people who define 
the language of whiskey tasting, it kind of cements it in. I'm, I'm going through Glenallachy, I just wonder if that word is butterscotch, especially when you look at the 15, which is, I think, very butterscotchy. <laughs> and I think... Sorry. Sorry. Uh, well, and I mean, I'm more interested in what you, you say about how it tastes than myself, but um, uh, if we're, we're all looking for the next Billy Walker classic like that Glendronach 15, and for me, it feels like... But, then Alecky 15 is the one. That's a bid for um, for something that's going to be one of these long-term, much-loved whiskies. Um, uh, aside from all the limited editions that come and go, Glen Alecky 15 is a wee cracker. It is a cracker, uh, uh, Arthur. And <clears throat> watch the 12-year-old, though, because I can tell you from the work I'm doing in the lab that uh, the 12-year-old is also an absolute belter. Um, um, and it... And that's not to say that the 10-year-old cash shed isn't either. But we're looking at the 12 and the 15 tonight. 15, and we will come on to it, um, but the, the 15 will, be a, will, will, will create a very big impact in the market, that's for sure. Um, but I have big hopes for the 12-year-old. As I say, in the tasting, and the warns, you know, the characteristics I'm looking for that we were building, the kind of building blocks are all there. You know, we've got dark chocolate mocha, maybe hints of cocoa, toffee, butterscotch, orange peel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lovely citrusy kind of lift. Yeah. It's, it's got that citrusy lift that kind of cuts through all the, the sweet associated flavours to stop it being cloying. It's, um... And at the back, you're getting some ginger and cinnamon. And, uh, yeah, well, listen, I'm not, uh, I'm pretty happy with the 12-year-old. But it's a journey, and we will continue to uh, to work on all of these expressions. We're, as I say, we, we have done the first 90% of the journey. The last 10% is always the most difficult part, but we are determined. I really, as a customer, I really like the way you're talking about the fact and acknowledging that core bottlings change all the time. And we are starting to see more of that rather than this kind of monolithic idea that a core bottling is just the same and it will always be the same but I love your attitude that you're seeking to improve it all the time and thinking you can you can get it better and better and I suppose part of that is some changes to production as well since you took over look when we took over the, the distillery is capable of producing about four million liters and we're currently operating at uh, 500,000, 550,000 liters of alcohol per annum. One of the advantages of taking the kind of reduced production route is that we can can now do significantly long fermentation. It's likely that uh, the previous owners, whoever they were, um, would have been running fermentation times somewhere between 50 hours and 60 hours. Uh, we are currently running somewhere between 160 and 180 hours. And there are many advantages to that. There are many challenges as well, because you have to make sure that, um, that you get very, very clean operation and that you don't actually get over acidic or unwelcome bacteria developing during the long fermentation. And the challenge is to make sure that as if there is bacteria developing, that it's friendly bacteria and it's uh, contributing to extending the flavor profile in the, in the, in the wash. Um, it also means that when we take it to the fermenter to, to the wash tub, we've got a much more benign fermentation. All of the activity is gone; it's dead. And if you go at uh, if you go to the, the, the stills in about 52 hours, there is still some activity in the in in the wash, and uh, you know then you have to be very very careful at the the wash uh, distillation stage, or uh, you can get some uh, one or two problems in terms of flare up. And was it was it running up at those huge levels um, of production up to the point you bought it? Um, yeah, I think I think that probably during the process of us, of us committing to buy it, it probably actually t uh, tailed back a bit. But yeah, it was running about uh, it was running about uh, three and a half four million. And of course, all the support uh, uh, kind of utilities round about it support a distillery that uh, can produce um, four million liters which means it will get bagged water. We'll get two wonderful uh, 
dams up in the up in the up in the moor. Um, and all the support, there was an evaporator and there was a digester. Um, but at the level we operate, we don't need to, we're not using the evaporator and we're not using the digester. So it's a much more simple operation. And uh, for somebody like me, it has to be quite a simple operation. I'm very <laughs> happy. We're very happy we're operating at, uh, at the level we're operating at. Um, There's a big, big shift in culture for the guys that work there. Um, output, output, the yield, yield, and then suddenly to dial it back down and longer fermentations, um, uh, a very think, different way for them to work. No, it's different, Arthur, but I mean, it, it, it wasn't so difficult in the sense that uh, all of the people who worked there, we were happy to employ, uh, but none of them were, none of them actually joined us because their conditions of employment, they were all older people who had substantial investments and pensions so we had to recruit we had to recruit a, a, a new force experienced people Richard BT excellent operator um, Philip Murray who had been with Diageo and uh, and uh, um, I can't remember the other story but guys that guys who I, I knew and was familiar with um, and I, yeah I think they do like operating at the kind of I'm going to say boutique level. It's not maybe not quite boutique level, but at a level that allows you to build in some slack. There's no pressure. There's no pressure on the actual utility itself. Plenty of opportunity. We had to go down for a couple of weeks, no problem. So yeah, it's nice. Um, and, and, and in truth, it's a, it's an interesting distillery. You know, the, the, the say the water the water challenge doesn't exist. We get bags of water. Wonderful. Um, we're in we're on the kind of side of the of Ben Rinnis that uh, where most of the water sheds. Um, there is of course Ben Rinnis facility which takes some of it, and the other side there is Lymphatlas, which takes the, the water shedding from the other side. Um, but we're lucky we, because the kind of the kind of curve of the, the mountain gives us a huge amount of water, which is always always very welcome. Yeah, you do hear some incredible statistics about what a distillery like Glen Farkless uses, which is, well, less than four million, I think, isn't it? You know, quarter of a million litres a day or something like that in terms of processed water is the kind of figures you you hear. It's staggering. It's a big plus. Water, water is hugely important. We're yeah. also looking at other things. You know, we're looking at, uh, we're looking at our, our yeast management and some top dressing opportunities with the wine yeast and champion yeast and some other yeast, natural yeast. So that's not happened yet, but it's something we intend to uh, do some work in the early part of next year. And other distilleries that you've worked with, you've um, implemented a, a peated program as well. Is that yeah, something we're running, you're looking at? Yeah, we're running a very, I mean, we've been running the PT program now for two years. Um, I had a look at, uh, I've been following the development uh, and there's, they're coming along beautifully. And as you know, Arthur, um, it's the one category of Scotch whisky that you can comfortably bring to the market at a relatively young age. And I mean relatively young, I don't mm -hmm. mean very young. And if you engage the right kind of wood and with uh, the, the kind of peat levels are quite, although it's sweet peat, peat levels are pretty high, you know, they're probably in about 30, 35 ppm. And we'll go, mm -hmm. So what are two interesting things that are on there as well? We've done a very rich cut from the, the PT distillation, which will give us a uh, PPM of peat in that cut of about 80, 85 PPM. And that's maturing separately. Uh, and we are following that also uh, quite carefully. It's fantastic, I have to say. It really is fantastic stuff. But that's for another discussion. Yeah, we've got a bit of time there, haven't we? Um, but I can't wait. That sounds good. Um, so uh, Sean is looking largely ready. So, I mean, was there anything else you wanted to say about the 12 and 15? I was so eager to ask you questions about other things. I mean, you're... Um, no, I think I really haven't spent enough time on the 15. I mean, 15, I agree with you. The 15 is the stellar one in the, in the, in the range. Uh, the, 12, the 12 and the 10-year-old are just behind it, but they're coming up fast mm -hmm. in, the, in the last furlong. Um, and all of the characteristics I was saying about the kind of building walls, you know, the, the, the structure of the cast use is the same, PX, Boros, Virgin, um, and almost the same percentages. But interestingly, as we're looking at how the brand developed, and we, by the way, incidentally, we do 
celebrate differences in batches. That's how it should be. This is a natural product. Uh, as you well know, you can have one cask standing next to another in a micro environment and, they, and absolutely the same provenance of the cask and they behave totally differently. That's how wonderful this game is. Um, but we knew, anyway, going back, we knew what the building blocks were. We're looking for, we've got the virgins in there, we've got some American barrels, we've got PXL also. And the one thing that I'm looking at going forward is I think I'm going to put more, a higher percentage of Oloroso into the range as we develop. Um, but the 50-year-old, the characteristics are the same as the 12. You coffee, dark chocolate, Christmas cake, raisins, orange zest, vanilla, butterscotch, toffee, hints of treacle. Mm. Did have a slide of the 15, but so that's what it looks like. Um, it just feels like it's peaking. It, when you get that feeling that the whiskey is at the right age for me, and that's totally personal. You're the expert. You've tried all the dynamic in all the warehouse, but for me, that just feels like the right age for it. Um, you know, uh, you know it's a fantastic comment and a fantastic question because the, the ultimate challenge for the blender. The ultimate challenge for the blender is to get the, the whiskey at the sweet spot. And, mm. you know, it's not impossible, and it happens quite often that if you get it into the wrong cask and you overcook it, then it goes past the sweet spot. That's why it's so important to be following the development of, uh, of the cask, particularly the, the, the kind of whiskies you know are going to be within the kind of selection process over the next two or three years see how they're developing. Are they getting to the point? Are they getting near the point? Uh, understand and have this recorded in your Bible of notes that says this is next and this is how it should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, really, really, really delightful whiskey. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to have it arranged. And it's, it, you talk about sweet spot. I was thinking earlier also and just jotting down the names of Whiskies that our customers miss the most if they don't exist or still love to buy. And so many of them are in that category. You know, Mortlick 16, Glendronach 15. I hope this will go into that category. Highland Park 18, our Beg 17. You know, that 15 to 18 year old area is hopefully hopefully affordable as a um as a treat, admittedly. You can't you can't maybe drink it every day. But it's also just got this magic combination of spirit still there, spirit character still there, yes. influence of wood, influence of wood and complexity, and um, and uh, yes, yeah, so many of our most loved whiskies over the last twenty years have kind of sat in that bracket. I think now, there's others I'm forgetting, but um, uh, it's a great age for whiskey. It is a great age, and and actually, you raise a very interesting question because. As you move into the older whiskies, into the kind of 20 and older, um, there is actually an argument to say that, that maybe you need to have some whiskey coming through in relatively, um, relatively less uh, active casks so that they, they, they retain some of the kind of spirited life. Um, and then you can move, maybe at 12, 15, you can move it into some other alternative interesting richer wood. Um, so a lot of things, we're, we're, there's a lot of things spinning around at the moment. Um, but the 12 and 15, very happy. Yeah, well, it's, you sound like you're having a lot of fun, which is great. We want <laughs> we want people like you to be enjoying the process and not having stressful days because it sounds great. Get, wander around a warehouse, putting whiskey together. I'm sure you have bad days, but um, it's great to hear you're enjoying it so much. Oh, it's great. Um, yeah, well, let's, let's bring Sean in. So... Um, Sean, just to give a little introduction, so um, Sean is a consumer, he's, um, he's a whiskey fan, whiskey drinker, and he corralled a notorious um, Facebook group, the, the Glendronach Appreciation Society, GAS for short, and he, um, he corralled it and managed it very well because it was an enthusiastic bunch of people, and uh, I'm sure plenty of them are watching tonight as well because... Uh, um, uh, because they followed your career with interest and many have gone over to, to Glen Araki. So, uh, yeah, speaking for the people. Hi, Sean. <laughs> Hello, Arthur. Hi, Billy. Hi. 
I love the I love the phrase corral makes me feel like a cowboy rushing around. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, well, I suppose we're getting to the point where um, we can try the two single casks. So um, I'm just trying to get uh, barely two ticks. I'll get that away from your head, Billy. Um, so uh, we have we'll, we'll let you fire some questions at Billy soon, Sean. But I suppose let's um introduce these two single casks so i had a little taste and i saw the 2006 first um the 2006 they're both punchins uh, yes 2006 is px um you might have thought the other way around but the 2006 is px and the 2009 is Oloroso. um they both take water pretty well and should have water added. I always like to know that if someone's tried it before. Um, I think it's going to take us a little time to kind of assess them. So let's give ourselves, what, five, ten minutes with the 2006 and have a wee chat and then we can come back to that and, and give a few thoughts. I suppose you have just to strike on, a ballot. Just on that, uh, Arthur, you're right. The, the, the PX uh, is strangely golden rather mm. than moving towards mahogany and, and that tells you again i can tell you the history of this cast this was in a it, it was in a very very top end uh, px punching um but you can never ant quite anticipate how the whiskey and the, the wood are going to interface um and this is a classic example of where in my opinion the flavor profile and both the notes of flavor are excellent um and it doesn't really, the, the depth and the, the richness of the flavour doesn't really reflect, is not reflected by the colour. Um, no. And as we, we as we collectively know, just sometimes people do drink a little bit with their eyes. Um, mm -hmm. But this is actually very, very nice uh, um, sherry style whisky. Um, but I'm not going to say which I favour. Um, well, I quite like the one taste, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think actually, just to give a bit of background, so you had um, you had pre-selected these casks as appropriate for the single yes. cast program. Then I had, I think, seven samples sent to me, and I chose two that I felt were contrasting, um, slightly different price points. Um, in fact, let's just I did. Give some estimate to price. There's a few factors that feed into that. So we're on the 2006. So when it comes to market, it won't be less than 100, unfortunately, but a bit, you know, a little bit over in and around that price, that price point. High strengths, of course. So the duty doesn't help that. And uh, there's Billy with his pipette. He'll hand pipette every single 70 CL for us. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, great. Well, we're off and running, and maybe let's. Let's assess it and say what we think in, in five minutes or so. On the 2006, um, mm. Alpha, you know, it's approximately 60, 60.5. At this strength, this is very, very drinkable. It's comfortable with adding water, uh, but this is very drinkable, this strength. Mm. One of the reasons, I think, why I thought this is, this is really good, you know, and the flavour profile, I actually jotted down some notes just before we, I joined you. I mean, I'm getting layers of fruitcake, dates, treacle, mocha, orange zest on the, on the taste. On the nose, surprisingly, I'm picking up hints of pineapple. Of course, there's honey. Orange peel, definitely, orange zest and nutmeg. I wrote some fairly similar uh, comments. I, I, I was thinking apricot jam, apricot pastries as well a kind of pastry element to it as well um uh and still with a like slightly serially heart as well i thought yes um, which is good i like that i like that it, pinning all these kind of flavors down but it's zingy in the mouth it really is interfacing with your taste buds There's on on the nose for me. There there's heaps of cereal and maltiness, mm. and it's kind of intertwined with a um, like a sticky fruit as well. And and then a couple of noses in, I was getting hit like almost like a hint of Nutella, like a a, a, pe a chocolate and peanut spread on toast, which again brings that multi cereal note back in. So it's uh, and 
the very first sniff, it's quite alcohol forward, so it's a bit of a punch in the face, and then give it 10, 15 seconds, and it really calms down and subsides. Uh, I felt, yeah, backing up your theory thing, I thought kind of sweet maltiness um, kind of reminded me of like a shredded wheat, but also like digestive biscuits, brown toast, that kind of cereally thing. But all a good fruity, caramelly heart. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, well, Sean, have you got any questions for Billy as, as we know his away? I have. I've got a few. And um, they're not difficult or techy or geeky, Billy, so you'll be pleased to know they're quite um, hopefully lighthearted and easy. Uh, <laughs> so since, since March, um, because we've all been affected globally with COVID, um, and it's affected all sorts of businesses, whatever they are, all around the world, how has it specifically affected you guys at Glenallachy and, and the production of what you do? And when I say production, I don't just mean creating spirit um i mean things like well that as well but also the other things like uh the, the dry packaging the cardboard get it getting your suppliers to supply the boxes um the bottling uh process itself the shipping for the companies that you use and all the other aspects of production that aren't necessarily the first ones that people think which is making the spirit so how is it how is covid in the last six months affected you in that respect? You know, Sean, the, there are a million layers of answers to that question, but uh, from the from the distillery point of view, we just had to follow the guidelines. We had to separate, we had to close the, 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 the center for a period and the shop for a period. We separated the distillery side of the business from the, the batting, the warehouse side of the business and made sure that these cohorts worked uh, essentially uh, in, 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 in separate groups. Um, so actually running the distillery, we were little impacted. Of course, we had to put the right kind of controls in place. But in terms of bottling, I mean, that's been hugely difficult. Uh, the bottling plant um, had to close for a while and then it came back at 25, 30% of capacity. Slots, available slots were difficult. Dry goods, similarly getting dry goods. Um, and actually getting containers to ship was extremely difficult. And one of the reasons was that because America was affected and the, the motor industry in particular um, were not shipping uh, parts from China back into the States, a lot, of the, a lot of the containers were actually in China and you couldn't get access to them. So there were difficulties that you couldn't possibly have imagined. Um, but we've kind of got over them. And from a commercial point of view, we are absolutely remarkably surprised by how little we have been affected. Um, but as I said to Arthur earlier, we are very, we, we're not at all involved in travel retail. So that side of the business um, has had no effect on us. Um, we're not really big in the on trade. So mm -hmm. in many ways, we've not been affected. That. And in many ways, and I don't know if you've seen this too, Arthur, but a lot of people are now buying in the, the local um, uh, retailer. And mm. that's where we think, and this may sound like a conceit and I don't mean it to be, but that's where we're strong. We're strong in the private independent sector or we want to be strong in the private independent sector. And that sector has probably benefited from the, the on-trade being uh, constrained. Um, mm. So in terms of the commerciality of it, we are, we're okay. Um, in terms of the, the general management side of it, the, the building blocks are, are important. It's been quite difficult, but there is a degree of, normal, of normality returning, and let's hope that the, the, the cohort of useless politicians that run the world don't come <laughs> along and, and, and put, put a spike into that. Yeah, what you're saying about the consumer behaviour, Billy, that really chimed with me. And we had a lot in terms of buying local or buying small and thinking about who were they going to give a little bit of money to, basically. Yeah. Um, and I had lots of friends who I've known for years who, you know, got in touch and said, can I buy wine and beer off you? And I was like, we've been friends for 20 years and I've had a wine and beer shop for 15. Yes, you can. Why have you only started thinking about it now? And but it was people who suddenly, they had that jarring, they couldn't get into the supermarkets. They didn't want to linger and they didn't want to buy booze in the supermarkets. 
didn't feel appropriate. And there was a big spe shift to, to specialist retail and, and particularly local shops. Yeah. We tried, up at the distillery, we tried to, you know, we realised that um, the, the local community, the, the, tourist, the tourist levels had almost died. Um, so we, we, instead of the, the kind of bottle your own at the distillery, we actually bottled them and we kind of fed it into uh, the kind of local uh, private independent retailers. Um, and it was, I think, I think and hope it was helpful for them. And uh, yeah, look, this kind of shit happens and we just have to manage it. Um, and, and hopefully there is, we've kind of plateaued in terms of um, how we pull things together. The bottling is going okay. I mean, we bottled something like 17,000 cases at Brock's one uh, this week. So we're kind of back to a degree of normality in terms of running the business. Um, I just hope the world doesn't start spinning in the other direction. Yeah, absolutely. I just saw a comment come up. I think it was Michael Stewart. And he said he can pick up barley barley sugars yeah um, yes he's absolutely bang on for me i that he's i think he's nailed that yeah but you know it's barley sugar or it's butterscotch and it's somewhere in between it's it's just actually getting the right descriptor and that's a great that's a great challenge in tasting because and, and tasting i mean this time in the evening is not the best time to taste if you're in the blending community, you should be doing it somewhere between nine o'clock and ten o'clock in the morning. But your palate is probably at its freshest. Yeah, but a lot of the working from home community were doing that during lockdown. I think the old half ten, eleven o'clock drink, suddenly <laughs> taking the lead from the blenders. Um, I think it's a very good comment from Stephen Cook here that I totally agree with, and it's part of the reason I really wanted to put this one in. Not your classic PX, and absolutely wonderful. It is quite unusual, and there has been a lot of PX single casts around. And I, this one really intrigued me, um, and uh, I thought it was a good talking point. It hasn't got that thick, viscous um, character that some PX casts can have, and it just seems to have a lovely balance. I, I find it really interesting. I think that's um, why. It I think also that's why I chose it, Arthur, to, to put in front of you. That, uh, oh, you get the credit. You get the credit. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the credit will be in the people who decide what they want to choose. True. But it was, inter it was interesting. Yeah. And interesting, well, interesting is always good. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It'll be um, interesting to see what people's views are if they taste this blind without seeing the colour first. Because, yeah. as you, Billy, as you said earlier on, people sometimes taste with their eyes. And this is a brilliant example of what you see is not what you get. I checked it three times. I went back to your cast codes because you have these little cast codes, Billy, and I was like, okay, uh, what is the cast number? Yeah, 1450. It says it's PX. Tried it. It says it's PX. And then even before committing to it, I checked again. That's definitely the PX cast. But great. I love it. I'm, I'd be delighted if that went into a bottle. Um, but that's true of both whiskeys. So. Um, Talking about COVID and big surprises, which no one could predict, were there, this might be a difficult question, Billy, but were there things like with your experience that when you took over Ben Rieke and Dronach, that kind of era that you felt you knew was going to happen, that was changing in the market, that you kind of predicted and got right? Or, or were, and were equally, the second part to that question, were there things that astonished you? Yes, uh, when when we acquired, and I think Sean and I had this conversation before, when we acquired Ben Reich, um there was something like 20 malt distilleries mothballed or closed. And uh, that reflected a time when uh, the industry had less confidence either in itself or the future. Um, it also reflected a time when the single malt market was essentially still owned and controlled by the big four. Um, uh, and I have to say that the independent bothers and, and people like uh, Caden Head and Gordon McPhail, um, the Lane brothers and Andrew Simonton, in parallel were doing the most fantastic job in opening people's eyes to what single malt was all about, and indeed developing and building people's interest in the category. When we acquired Ben Riech, um, the category was still 
the boutique side of the single malt business was still relatively flat and malt was owned by the big boys. What's happened in the last uh, yeah, 15 years is really quite a revolution. You know, people have suddenly become alive to single malt and uh, their interest is growing and growing. And the more they delve into it, the more they challenge you to do things that uh, they're looking for you to do and improve the quality and move the whole thing forward. But the last 15 years has been astonishing. Did it surprise me? Absolutely. Where single malt is today and where it was in 2004, frankly, is remarkable. And more power, I have to say, more power to these independent bottlers who are opening up different kinds of ideas about single malt and, uh, and, and, and taking expressions to the consumer that the big boys just wouldn't have thought about. And going back to something we said earlier on, this embracing of inconsistency as well, which was when I first started learning about whiskey, it was all about you tried to get whiskey to taste the same each time. And Springbank were deemed a bit weird that their 10-year-old would taste different every time you bought a bottle. But now inconsistency is just revel. People love it. They love it when there's change. It's to be celebrated. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, there's, there's a question for me, actually. It's what's Michael saying, ask oh, somebody, are you worried that the colour will sway consumer choice? Most Glenarity single sharp, cut, sherry casts are so dark. Um, how would it stand up on Sean Russell's other sherry bomb appreciate? Sean Russell's other sherry bomb appreciation page. Um, <laughs> Try saying that when you've had a few single casks, Arthur. <laughs> there, there is a funny thing at the moment, and again, you go back to um, when I first started working in retailing and at Scotch Mall Whiskey Society before that, there was this thing that some people just like dark whiskey, and I like dark whiskey. And it, we kind of rolled our eyes a bit at it, and then it went away, and suddenly it's back. People really dig dark whiskey at the moment. And I had someone trying to sell me uh, from an independent bottle of whiskey that had a mature colour, and that gave me the shivers. I don't like that. Um, so... What does that it's mean? Well, <laughs> yeah, I caught, I pulled him off on that. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, Michael, um, that's a point of everyone getting a sample in their hand and maybe part of the reason that people are going after dark colours in whiskies is because you get so little time to make your purchase choice now because some things sell out so quickly five bottles in a row go online on the website, people go for the dark one, and that's the one that sells out quickly. So that's the point of putting samples in people's hands and, um, and giving them the opportunity to, to make up their mind on taste. So, um, yeah, should we move on to the dark one? <laughs> got, just before we do, I've got to say that the finish on, on the... Um, yeah, let's on wrap it up. 1450 is so long. It's really long. Mm. I've still got it in my mouth. Yeah, and it's got that nice spice at the end, not dominant, um, but, you know, spicy you whiskey back? is lovely when it's just that finish. Are you back in the 15, Sean? No, I was on, I was talking about the first thing we can ask. The 1450. It's incredibly long on the finish. So we're on the, we're on the 5870 now, are we? The Olorosa. Yeah, let's move on to the Olorosa. Um, so also a punchin. So we're hoping there'll be uh, well, there's a big invoice, but there'll be plenty to go around. That's the nice thing about a, a punchin. Listen, the, the the mouth experience with this one is fantastic. It's all encompassing. Classically, all of so you're getting raisins, you're getting ginger, you're getting cloves, you're getting. Let me think. I did some notes just before we started. Of course, you've got honey. You're going to have honey and mocha, bits of treacle, marzipan and almonds, hints of grapefruit, cinnamon and cloves. It's lovely. It's a whole, uh, it's catching every part of my taste buds. It's heavy. It's really heavy. It's lovely. I mean, on the nose, um, I'm getting lots of. Um, Almost like um, a, a, a toffee sauce with cracked black pepper and then a load of overripe plums. 
slightly dusty. I'm getting plump, and I, I tried this again yesterday, and I said the top of a um, the top of a plum crumble. Um, so you got that kind of caramel. You got the fruit, yeah, and then you've got the caramelization as well. That's, that's um, exactly. Um, which uh, I really like. So plum, it's an orchard fruit, stone fruit, raspberry, um, mocha, mocha. Did you say mocha, Billy? Yes. Yeah. Chocolate, dark chocolate. More of a classic sherry cask. Still in balance as well, I would argue. Even though that's it's... exactly what I wrote down. It's a, a classic, heavy, typical, heavy, aromatic sherry bomb. Cool. Sherry cask, yeah. That's exactly what I wrote. It's, it's really lovely. Yeah, it's good. It's thick and oily. Chewy. Chewy. Yeah. Chewy. I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the results, I must say. I, I, I've... Um, there were a few other candidates because Billy chose some great casts, unsurprisingly. Um, I think side by side, these two, I don't know what you guys think. I think it's quite an interesting choice. And then, of course, you've got the price factor as well. So um, I quickly brought up on screen, but my estimates were we'll, we'll be able to get this one below 100 quid, which is great for a whiskey of this quality. Um, and uh, yeah, compared to 2006, which would be a, a little bit more. So, um, so that's another decision <laughs> for people, assuming they want to buy a bottle, of course. But... They're two good picks, and it's quite difficult. Yeah, we. Um, I must say, I'm quite enjoying not being the one to have to pick a cask in a way, to have that final decision. In fact, we, we, we spoke about this, Sean, when we were chatting online, weren't we? You, 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 when you pick the cask, you're confident it's the right one. You're delighted with yourself. Then the invoice comes in and it's just about to go on the shelf and then you panic and you think you've got yourself a dud and, and everything's about to go wrong. But this one won't be my fault, so... Um, I feel a bit more relaxed about it. <laughs> well, you know, Arthur, you, in, in this game, your first instincts are always the correct ones. Yeah, so far. <laughs> no, but it, it is that nerve-wracking moment where, uh, and of course, there's a few months normally, or you know, at least at least a month gone between when you choose a cask and when it actually gets to market, and that's enough time for. The doubt just to kind of crawl inside your head, um, but uh, no, I, I'm trying these again. We've got two, two lovely ones. Um, I, I, think, I think you can relax, Arthur, because regardless of what cask is picked, they're they're both really good and they're both worthy of going on the shelf. Yeah, yeah. So, as voice of the people, what what, what consumer type questions have you got for Billy then, Sean? It's, uh, Consumer type question. So I've said this before. I actually had a chat with David Keir some time ago and because he asked me, what do I like about um, Glen Allerkey? And it was a really simple and very quick answer was it's a, it's a proper drinking whiskey. I mean, you know, my wife hates whiskey and she can't stand the smell of it. And the only whiskey she's ever said that smells really nice was a Glen Allerkey. It was a, co a coval rye cask, actually. Um but, but the thing I've, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on Glenallochy by any stretch. I've tried a number now. I haven't tried as many as many other people who are probably on this uh, session. But the ones that I have tried, so from the vatted whiskies that you produce, Billy, what I really love is there. there is a consistent trademark kind of DNA that runs through all of them, which at the beginning of the conversation you were saying it's because it's a mixture of Oloroso and PX and uh, virgin oak. And what you managed to do is you from the 12 to the 15 to the, to the 12 year px to the other ones that you produce 10 year car strength there is a typical almost like a, per, a glen Allerkey personality and it's a really drinkable facet of what you produce it's good so for me from a consumer perspective it's a brilliant drinking whiskey through and through it's not a whiskey that i would 
hoard and hoard and hoard and try and get rid of it and sell it at an increased price, I, I would drink it. And that's what I do. And in fact, the nicest whiskey I've had in a long time, and I'm now, it's that, we're not talking about that tonight, but I've got to put it up there because that is absolutely incredible. That's what are we looking at here? That's the 12 year PX that you brought out okay. uh, yeah. 30 years ago. Um, so sorry for bringing out an, uh, a surprise whiskey there, Arthur. Oh, but don't that worry. Encapsulates exactly what I'm saying, which is the, which is the beautiful kind of like the the uh, caramelly, fruity, uh, sherry influence of of the core range, and of the cast strengths that I've tried, they're all really different, which is great. It's exciting, which goes back to Billy's original point earlier about going on a journey and and finding lots of things that are different and not worrying that they're different. Just put them out there and just. It's, it's a progressive growing exercise for the distillery. And I love that. That's really good. It's quite diverse. Mm. Um, well, there's a few people saying, can't you just bottle bugs? Um, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure David Keir and Ben Chambers would uh, would appreciate those comments. In fact, it's probably uh, a pseudonym that they've logged in as to say that, I would say. Um, but I think that's, that's a good measure of success. And I suppose if you've got 10 minutes uh, more or so, Billy, if you don't, we'll just put the call out to people to oh, yeah. have any questions. Yeah, and, and it may take a few moments just for them to come through. But um, uh, if anyone has any questions specifically for, for Billy out there, that would be great. Um, I just wonder, and maybe we can talk, we'll see how the voting goes because we have to stick to, um, uh, to what the people decide. Um, but I just wonder, leaving the 2006 a little bit longer might be quite interesting. Um, uh, I don't know what you think about that, Billy, if, if a little bit more time just might even make it even better. It just feels like one of those whiskies that's just going to grow in complexity, whereas the Oloroso in the 2009 is already having quite a big impact and feels like it should be bottled soon maybe what's your opinion there i think i think both of these could comfortably stay in cask for another two or three years um, right okay and uh would the complexity of the 2006 improve no but it might refine a little bit um but the period 2006 through to another two years would be yeah, it would be okay. Listen, it would it would move it on in a little direction, and not significantly, but it'd move it on. Two thousand and nine. Um, look, I think it's a terrific thinking. I think the two thousand nine is fantastic at the moment. Will it be the same in three years' time? It will be fantastic in a different way. But you can you can be sure that the cask is not going to disappoint going forward. Um, mm. But it's a nice point now, and um, if I had to choose personally, I would choose uh, probably the 2009. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I don't want to influence anybody. That's just personal. Cheeky comment from Peter Donnelly of Glen Farkless. P PX 2006 in a dark bottle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, likes, <laughs> he likes dark whiskey, clearly. Um, <laughs> I'm happy and tipsy, all round excellent whiskies. Right, here we go. Question coming in from Mr. Gavin Mackay. Does Billy think he will be working till he himself is laid down in wood? <laughs> well, there's a good chance. <laughs> uh, but you know what? And I'm sure everybody uh, thinks the same. That it's really great to get up in the morning and have a purpose and something to do. And the answer is yes. That would be a great end to life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I suppose once you start, you know, it's a, it's a never ending project, isn't it? Taking over the distillery, you, 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 dist you create this spirit, maybe these super long fermentation, you put it in these amazing casks, you peat it, you create a new spirit with this peated spirit or these new yeasts. You'll want to carry on and just see what happens and get in that yeah, warehouse all the time. Absolutely, Arthur. And an answer to is it an answer to Gavin? Yeah. Look, um, I kind of have covenanted to myself. I hope I live long enough to see the new full spirit that we produced in 2017 
become a 12-year-old experience. And that might be asking uh, the good Lord too much, um, but that would, uh, that would be great. Um, excellent. Well, Michael Stewart says, don't ever stop, Billy. We need you. Um, is, uh, is, is clearly the answer there. Which kind of wood would you choose? I guess we're talking coffins now. I mean, it's got very morbid all of a sudden, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, let's say we'll go with some uh, French oak. <laughs> First fill or, or refill? Um, uh, I'll go, we'll go with virgin. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, what changes do you see ahead for the industry, e.g. new cast types, etc.? I think it's a great question. I mean, that, the, the industry is changing and there's a lot of clever um, young companies and independent authors who are challenging the industry to be better and good and better and better. Um, you know, a lot of things, uh, probably what we're doing ourselves will reflect what's happening in the industry. You know, for example, we're going to release, I think it's sometime in the next couple of weeks, we're going to release a, a, a Fine oak wood series, which will cover chinkapin oak, um, Missouri oak, mm -hmm. um, Spanish oak, and, and French oak. The differentials between them are amazing, um, you know. And that's that's the beauty of this industry. That when you have an idea and you set the, set out in the journey and uh, see where your expectation of these different wood geniuses finally end up is fantastic. And I think. Uh, I don't know if anybody who's listening and has actually tasted the chinky, but I know that some of the names that have come off the screen will have tasted it, but the chinky pin oak, uh, virgin oak, is just fantastic. It's so different. Um, and I notice that there are other people in the industry now that are, uh, are actually kind of catching up to this, which from my point of view is not a wonderful thing, but uh, here we are. Um, and we're doing a lot of stuff, you know, there's a lot of very interesting wine barrels that we've bought over the last two or three years just following them. They tend to take longer in terms of delivering the kind of info that we're looking for, maybe three to five years. But you know, just tasting the difference, uh, how the journey, how it all evolves is, you know, it's great. And this is going to be a part of the industry. And, you know, it's not without, uh, it's not by uh, default that you even, even Chivas are bringing out derivatives of Chivas Regal in a rum cask. So, you know, the, even the big boys and the kind of legacy brands are dipping their toe into this kind of new interfacing with different styles of wood. All oak-based, but different uh, different histories. You're happy with the legislation? You don't think there should be any change? You, you, you no, I, I, I have to I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I think uh, what is there is there, it's what it is. I think the SWA do a fantastic job, um, and uh, I'm, I'm comfortable, but maybe it's my age, um, but I'm comfortable with, uh, with the rules as I've defined. Well, it's interesting to describe yourself as, as a traditionalist, but I, I think you're quite a creative one as well. You know, traditionalism oh, sometimes yeah. can be seen as stuffy maybe, but you, you are creative and innovative oh, yeah. just within those rules and not trying yeah, to push them out. Yeah, we are creative. And, and, and we've done quite a lot of things that uh, that have been different. And and, and I have to say that the, the two big guys, Chivas and uh, Diageo, have been extremely complimentary about a lot of the things we've done over the last few years. Well, I suppose this, this links quite well to discussion of um, being a traditionalist from Jedicious, Jedicus, Jedicus. Um, are there any current trends, changes in the industry that you'd wish would backpedal a little bit? Good question. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not quite sure that if there's a good answer to it. Um, <laughs> we can move on if you want. <laughs> no, 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 no. Look, I, in many ways I am a traditionalist. I'm, I, I am religiously devoted to age statements. I think it's important that you tell the consumer what uh, what uh, is in the bottle. Um, so maybe I'm not sure where the industry is going in terms of age statements, but they are important. And in terms of uh, of uh, you know Scotch whisky, it really is important to emphasise that we can actually produce 
terrific whiskey, old whiskey, um, and still retain you know decent volumes and decent strengths. And that is a, it's an important differential for us, and we shouldn't lose sight of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you th- th- this this cold, well, sorry, temperate, non-changeable climate. Uh, people are trying to force a terroir onto whiskey. It seems recently, but that's the big thing. You 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 can age it for a long time because there isn't dramatic shift in temperature and high heat. Absolutely, and you know if you if you go into a warehouse that has been uh, has been sitting pretty well full for. Uh, for an extended period of time, it's just like a refrigerator. You know, the temperature will vary a little bit up and down, but you know, the, the alcohol in the atmosphere acts like a refrigerant. So you've got a very, very, you've got a good, good environment. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, Becky asks, "What do you most enjoy about being in the whiskey industry or owning a distillery?" I think it's a great, it's just fun. The whiskey industry is fun. And as I said earlier, while it, uh, we, you know, we, ha- we, have, we have to compete with the other companies, it's friendly competition. And I have never been in a situation where if I had a problem that uh, one of the companies in the industry wouldn't uh, actually go out of their way to help. So, you know, it's, it's a good industry to be in. It's a long term. And one of the most important things from a Scottish point of view, it cannot be re- relocated. It is 100% Scottish. It cannot be made anywhere else. That's a good thing. Mm, yeah, I agree. Um, this is my favourite question of the evening so far from Willis Peel. Will we be able to order the eventual cask winner? Yes, you will, Mr. Peel. <laughs> I like that question. Um, uh, what's Peter saying? I see my name. Ooh, Arthur, don't be going saying the T word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, shall we expect new core range editions soon from I can't even say that um, Tassa Darf um, yes the, the answer is yes there will be a, we will introduce a 21 year old um, I think we're bottling it in October this year and we will definitely launch a 30 year old um, probably in the second quarter next year um but there won't be big volumes but uh i've had i've been following these very close and the 21 year old is to die for i absolutely to die for um okay and question from stephen cook there have been a lot of great hand fills and single cast like glen Alecky later do you have a favorite Look, the one that's been released at any one time is the favourite because it's the one we've chosen. Um, and that's an interesting part of the whole um, the whole kind of single malt experience now is that uh, there is a consumer out there who has an appetite for single casks, and it's great. You know, um, it, it's a challenge. Um, it's a lot more difficult to to manage single casks in terms of dry goods and things. But we, we, there is more and more informed consumers out there that are looking for this, these points of difference. Um, so an answer to the question is, the one that's favourite at the time is the one that's just been released because it's the freshest in my mind. Um, but there's a lot of very, very nice uh, nice whiskey and cask. And uh, you know, yesterday I was looking at some Pony Port uh, casks and uh, my goodness, the difference in how they develop is amazing. It's just, this is what's so wonderful about this industry that you can never quite be sure. You know how the journey starts? You're never quite sure where the journey will end or indeed when it will end. So each of these casks has been, has been special. We've chosen them because they are special and uh, they're all my favourites. Yeah, well, old Nico says... He thinks that 2006 is Billy's favourite because there's quite a lot out of the bottle there when you look on the, on the desk. <laughs> so, um, well, I think we've, we've probably reached a, a natural conclusion there. Um, and um, I'm aware, Billy, you're still in the office. Uh, it's a late night for you in the office there. And um, really grateful for your time and also Sean as well for and for both of you and um, sharing these whiskies, which... Um, I'm delighted with uh, the core range bottlings and, and the two single casts. Fascinated to see what people choose. Um, 
And yeah, thank you, Billy. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Billy, so much for your time and your honesty with answering all the questions that came your way. Um, I know uh, we've got lots of whiskey lovers who really appreciate that honesty and the, and the work that you do. Um, so uh, yes, thank you very much, guys. Thanks for inviting me. Cheers. No thank problem. You. I, hope, I hope to see you soon. Um, so uh, yeah, great night, uh, really enjoyable. Uh, just before we go, um, as ever, just to recap, uh, firstly, if you can vote, um, that would be great. You should have that link, and I think it was shared earlier on, so it will be in the um, in the comments uh, somewhere on Facebook, uh, I believe. But get in touch if you can't if you can't find it. And then we always just end by saying what's coming up next, and we've got some really cool stuff coming up next, actually. So I'm just going to have to find it. Um, so next tastings. Some dates not quite uh, confirmed because we have to wait for the mini bottles to be bottled. But so the first one, Arden Merkin tasting with um, Alex Bruce and probably a few other people. Uh, they are bottling their first Arden Merkin single malt, which is tremendously exciting. Um, a distillery that I'm following with great interest. So we'll get the date soon when uh, the packs will be ready and we can sell them and it should be happening early in Oct early October so we're probably a week or 10 days away one hopes for getting those mini packs so we can sell them so that will be great uh, then we've got a two-part 20th anniversary tasting with John Glazer so Compass Box has tur is turning 20 in October and uh, without going into too much detail just like to tease it a little bit but uh, John has raided his archive and is kind of doing two greatest hits tastings of past bottlings and then a couple of um, special bottlings that he's doing for his um, anniversary. Um, and um, what else we got? Um, a Berry Brothers tasting with, um, with Johnny McMillan and the inimitable Ronnie Cox. Um, tasting, I think, all single cask, including a couple of exclusives uh, that we've got coming and already signed up. We've already picked those ones and they're absolute beauties. So, uh, yeah, the pack sale dates are on there um, and a really, really exciting autumn programme. So thanks very much for tuning in, guys. It's great there's still interest in these online tastings. Uh, we really enjoy them and uh, hope to see you next time. Cheerio.